You've been watching NBC News special coverage of America's reaction to the release of the video of the fatal beating of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee, a killing by police officers, now former police officers, that has led to protests ongoing tonight in a number of major cities. And reaction is coming in from leaders in Colorado as well who have viewed the video that you just saw portions of on NBC Nightly News. Democratic Governor Jared Polis released a statement tonight saying that Coloradans are in mourning with the Nichols family. The governor writing, quote, this incident is inhumane and appalling and our heart breaks for the senseless death of Tyree Nichols. No parent should have to experience what the Nichols family is going through. Also hearing from some law enforcement in our state, the chief of police in Colorado Springs said he was horrified by seeing the video and said that he wanted to emphasize that all police departments should be having conversations with our communities about what law enforcement looks like moving forward. Through the resources of NBC News, we're monitoring the situation tonight in Memphis as well as New York City, where at the moment there are peaceful protests, people in the streets, uh, who are voicing their concerns about continued police brutality in America. The latest incident, this video of Tyree Nichols beating death at the hands of multiple Memphis police officers. You saw Lester Holt there talking about how at one point Mr. Nichols runs for officers, apparently fleeing for his life as they will not stop assaulting him while he was on the ground. We continue to monitor the situation in Memphis and elsewhere and keep you up to date while we look at some headlines locally. Douglas County is trying to tell people that handouts do not help those experiencing homelessness. Douglas County is trying to convince citizens to get people to donate to nonprofits instead, and they're citing public safety as their concern. We asked the newly elected sheriff, and he couldn't point to any instance of anybody being hurt in donating to a panhandler. So Nusha Roy asked him why they're launching this program. The Douglas County Sheriff and a county commissioner wanted to meet at a busy intersection, I-25 and Lincoln. We're worried about uh, somebody getting uh, injured in a traffic crash. Either a person receiving cash or giving it. It's a part of the reason these county signs are showing up saying handouts don't help and to give safely through DouglasHasHeart.org. Really represent our common sense view in Douglas County, which is if you're handing out money at intersections, you're only going to get more people asking for money at intersections, right? So the idea in Douglas County is compassion is who we are, giving safely is what we request. Republican County Commissioner A. Bladen said he's been talking to folks who said homelessness is a big concern, even though the homeless community is small. Our point in time for homelessness is right around 78, uh, which isn't a high number. So instead of giving cash at intersections, the county wants people to go to a county website to donate to four non profits already listed the county has been working with for years and I don't know who um, Douglas County is to tell people not to ask for the things that they need the idea doesn't sit well with Kathy Alderman an advocate she's responding to concerns from the county leaders who said you don't know how the cash will be spent I think condescending to people experiencing homelessness to say that you know if they're not going to use the money to get a job or get sober or um, immediately um, do what you want them to do, then you shouldn't assist them. We often hear, um, especially from the Douglas County commissioners, this idea of um, independence um, and, and freedom to do as you see fit, yet they're telling people what they can and cannot do with their own money. Douglas County is all about freedom, and we want to ensure that the rights of all of our citizens are being respected. Handhandling is not illegal, but a person could get in trouble for interfering with traffic. The sheriff, Darren Weekly, said last year they responded to around 400 calls regarding people experiencing homelessness. General complaints of handhandling, uh, people in the roadway, uh, just deputies making contacts with folks and, and talking to them. The sheriff said he is worried if people are living with substance use or mental health issues and if it could turn into a dangerous situation. Have you had any incidents where people have been hurt, either the panhandler or the person trying to donate? Uh, not yet, uh, but it is a concern for us. When asked if this is about trying to move the homeless out of Douglas County. I mean, no, it's 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 a free country, but the, the fact of the matter is, is we want uh, zero homelessness in Douglas County. There's services available to folks that genuinely want help and need help. Uh, but what we're trying to eliminate is people just standing on street corners begging for money.
So the county also has a team called HEART, which is pairing up officers and community partners to connect people with resources. They made contact with 147 people in the last couple of months of 2022 after they launched. That number is going to vary from the point in time count you heard about in that piece because that's just numbers from one night versus the HEART numbers, which are over several months, Kyle. You know, Nusha, when I first heard about this, I thought back to what Denver did 15 years ago when they put up, essentially, they look like parking meters, and they encourage people to put their spare change into those parking meters, and it would go to services to help the homeless. It's a bit more of a, a strong-arm approach to say, don't just give here, but don't give to them. We're seeing a couple of municipalities do it, though. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing the similar messaging in Colorado Springs, the similar messaging in Aurora, again, encouraging people to give to nonprofits versus people who are uh, at that intersection or at that busy intersection. I asked Douglas County, well, how are you going to oversee all of this money that's coming in? They said it's going to be their community foundation that's going to make sure that those donations are being spent properly. All right, Anusha, thank you. Denver's once again activating emergency warming shelters with sub-freezing temperatures coming in this weekend and early next week. The McNichols building is going to be open 24-7 through Wednesday morning. There will be short-term warming centers also available during normal business hours at rec centers and Denver Public Library locations. The city is also directing people to the city's traditional shelter network. There are homeless advocates urging the city of Denver to change its cold weather sheltering plans. They don't want it to have to be so brutally cold before these warming centers open. In November, the Department of Public Health in Denver told city council that they were in the process of updating these policies, which activate, activate the overnight shelters if temperatures are going below 10 degrees or if there's more than six inches of snow coming. The city hasn't released an updated policy, but the health department says they've unofficially bumped that threshold up to 20 degrees. Tonight, we're taking our first look at the money pouring into the Denver mayor's race. There are 17 candidates on the ballot, with most opting into the new fair election fund, which provides some matching taxpayer funds in return for donation limits. The top fundraiser in the race for Denver mayor has one big donor himself. Andy Rougeau, seen here using a miter saw and a dress shirt, as the lone Republican in the race. He's loaned his campaign half a million dollars. He's not participating in the Fair Elections Fund taxpayer financing. Kelly Bruff, favorite of the business community, has raised nearly half a mil. 135000 of that comes from the taxpayer match. Her largest donors include a who's who of corporate CEOs, lobbying firm employees, developers, and builders. Leslie Herod has raised 370000 including fair election funds. She also has her fair share of power player donors, including, you're never going to believe this, some of the same people who gave to Kelly Bruff. Debbie Ortega is nearing $200,000 raised, and she's received the only outside expenditure so far, a group spending in support of a campaign. Mike Johnston's $185,000 raised does not yet include his fair election funds, which will add to the haul already brought in from his deep fundraising network following unsuccessful runs for governor and senator. Investment banker Thomas Wolf and environmental activist Ian Tafoya have fair election funds that dwarf what they've raised from donors and both top the $100,000 mark. Those numbers will keep being updated as fair election fund matches come in and the candidates filed reports. So we'll keep you updated. State legislators held a rare joint memorial today, a final tribute to former House Minority Leader Hugh McKean. He died of a heart attack last October. He represented Loveland in the State House since 2016, and he was elected as leader of the House Republicans in 2020. Memorials for state legislators are typically held in the chamber where they serve, but today members from both chambers, both parties, gathered to remember McKean, uh, talking about his kindness, his positivity, his love of Colorado. He would help me worry less about the intricacies of a policy for just a moment and did what he did time and time and time again and remind me of the tremendous honor and privilege we have in this room, in this space, for such a limited period of time. Last year, McKean became the first legislator to lie in state since former Lieutenant Governor Joe Rogers in 2013. When a victim of domestic violence, and sometimes kids in the family, need a safe place to spend the night, there are very few shelters in Colorado that will also take in their pet. 
That is one way that Gateway in Arapahoe County stands out. And it's one reason why Gateway is the recipient of your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. The domestic violence shelter in Aurora hoped that you might be able to raise $15,000 to support their work. Well, you did that in about 15 minutes. You've raised nearly $30,000 for that shelter where families can get counseling, kids can get mental health support, survivors get court advocacy through the justice system process, and also pets get a safe place to stay. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and you can join me and a bunch of other people in donating. Gateway makes certain that when survivors make the courageous choice to leave, everyone, including a beloved pet, gets to safety. The governor says state regulators need to do something about skyrocketing energy bills. Great, because the governor is the one who appoints those people. The Coloradans most impacted by air pollution are asking for a break. And 104 years later, she has seen her share of good news and all the other stuff of life. Perspective from our favorite Friday question, next. Protesters in Memphis, Tennessee have taken over Interstate 55 tonight and are preparing to march into the downtown area about an hour after Memphis police released the videotape that shows now former police officers brutally beating a man by the name of Tyree Nichols, a man who begs with them that he's trying to comply, a man who begs with them at one point for his mother as they beat him on the ground, then chase him when he gets up to run away. There are protests in a number of American cities tonight. Things have been calm but passionate in Memphis so far. We'll continue to keep an eye on the situation as a lot of people react with frustration and anger over another video showing police brutality in America. Here at home, Governor Jared Polis is getting involved in the debate over rising utility bills. Days after state regulators that he appointed were out there defending the rising costs. Spokesperson for the governor said that Polis is going to take steps in the coming weeks to direct state regulators like the Public Utilities Commission to provide immediate cost relief and cost-saving strategies for natural gas customers. We don't know what those steps are going to be, but we know that the governor knows how to get these commissioners' attention. He appointed two out of three of them. There's a third commissioner on his way out, soon to be replaced with another Polis appointee. Meanwhile, Excel is simultaneously seeking a rate reduction in bills for February and March because the company says it paid less for natural gas than expected, but is asking for a later increase in electric rates. Colorado's air quality regulators are considering new protections for communities most vulnerable to pollution. This is an effort to comply with the state's Environmental Justice Act. It passed last year, allocating funding to target pollutions in communities of low-income areas and communities of color. The proposal would require facilities causing pollution to comply with stricter air pollution standards along the front range. That would include special permits, increased monitoring, using more emission-controlling technologies. Companies applying for new air quality permits in certain communities would also have to write up an environmental justice plan in order to get that permit. The proposals go beyond state guidelines. The state health department said they were drafted based on feedback from Coloradans and disproportionately impacted communities like Pueblo and Commerce City. The state's Air Quality Control Commission will consider the proposals at a hearing later this year. Tonight's next question comes from Jim. He wants to know, why is the DMV using the letter O in the numeric portion of license plates? Hmm. I, I, that's a good question, Jim. It feels like it would be confusing to law enforcement. You got the zero and the O right next to each other? I don't know about that. So we asked the Colorado DMV, and they told us that the three-letter, three-number system that they've used for license plates since 1982 ran out of new combinations in 2018. So they rolled out a new letter number combination that uses four letters, then two numbers. So a license plate could be theoretically like LMN and then O12, not 012. So that's why you'll occasionally see letters creeping over onto the right side of our license plate. The DMV swears up and down that, that the font that they're using differentiates the O's from the zeros enough that law enforcement is not confused about it. 
we had a mild afternoon today as we prepare for very cold weather and even a little bit of snow to push on in to the state. Right now we're at 38 degrees at DIA. It feels like 29 with those winds coming in from the west northwest at around 15 miles per hour. As we take a look at our HD Doppler radar, you can see this system that pushed its way in last night and is continuing to push its way just a bit further south, really just bringing that cloud cover and colder temperatures to the southern half of the state. Northern half of the state is where any sort of snow is going to be, and we're not expecting a whole lot across the front range in eastern plains, just a little bit making its way out of the northeastern corner of the state, where we are going to continue to watch for more snow is going to be the northern mountain ranges and then dipping into portions of the western slope, mostly along the I-70 corridor right now. So we do have winter weather alerts in effect until 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon. This is going to be winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories, where we're just going to watch for a lot of snow falling in the northern mountain ranges and into the western slope there, along with gusty winds, creating that blowing snow and reduced travel. Now, in addition to that, we are going to see extremely cold temperatures. Now, this is what we really want to focus on over the next couple of days. So we already have wind chill advisories for central and southern portions of the eastern plains and then portions of the front range as well. Colorado Springs down the I-25 corridor to Pueblo, where you could see those overnight wind chill values anywhere between 20 below zero to 30 below zero. This is going to be Saturday night into Sunday and then Sunday night into Monday. Outside of that, before we see the cold weather push in, tonight we'll see a low near 19 degrees and then those temperatures in the 30s tomorrow, teens Sunday and Monday, and then we start to warm up and clear out as we go into next weekend. Some good news from a great, great grandmother. I have grandsons, granddaughters, great granddaughters, and great, great granddaughters. She's got 104 years worth of good news to share. Next. Each week on Friday, we go out and ask Coloradans for the headlines of their lives. What's your good news? Once in a while, we will meet someone so special, they get the entire segment to themselves. Viola Castell, resident of Highlands Hill Senior Living in Westminster, certainly qualifies. Surrounded today as she rang in her 104th year. Today is Viola's 104th birthday party. I'm just a nervous old woman. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. Ready as I'll ever be. Okay. <laughs> My good news is that these residents are here to enjoy this birthday party for our resident turning 104. Do you remember a hundred years ago when you turned four? A hundred? No, I don't. All I knew was to play may do hopscotch in the yard. And we got it all drawn out and the big old dog would plant himself right in the middle of it. My good news is that I have a wonderful family. I had a wonderful mommy and daddy. I loved them all. I love them all very, very much. Of course, Mommy and Daddy have been gone for some time. But the family's still here. They still call me. They take care of me. And that, I think, is the best news that I could have. Boy, you ever wonder if your parenting matters? There's a 104-year-old talking about how much she loves her mommy and daddy.